Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to my YouTube channel. My name is John Campia, and this is Mailbag. What is Mailbag? Well, I'm awfully glad that you asked. See, every day on the John Campia Show, Monday through Friday, we take the second half of the show to take your live comments and questions. But you've got to be watching the show live in order to be able to send those questions. So what if you're one of those people that watches the show one of the other 22 hours during the day? Well, that's why we have Mailbag. If you've got a comment, thought, observation, question that you'd like myself or sometimes Rob to address, Simply go down into the description of this video and you'll see a tip link. Click on that or enter it in manually at www.streamelements.com slash movieblogtv slash tip. You'll begin your comment or question right on a mailbag episode if we deem your comment or question appropriate to be used on our show. And of course, you'll be supporting our channel at the same time. And all of us involved with the John Campy channel, thank you guys so much for your support. Okay, guys, it is Friday, May the 20th, so I hope you guys are ready for a great weekend for yourselves, filled with relaxation and fun, and whatever it is you need this weekend. For now, let's jump into the questions that you guys have been sending in. We're going to get things started off here with Jerome, who writes, In Lord of the Rings, why do you think Elrond didn't destroy the ring himself when Isildur refused to do it? For example, uh, if he was concerned the ring would corrupt him too, he could have pushed Isildur into the fire. Okay, yeah, so there is that, but there's a couple of things that I've heard this discussion before because, like, once they defeated the armies of Sauron and they got his ring and Isildur had his ring and Elrond and Isildur go into Mount Doom to throw it in and Isildur decides, no, I'm going to keep it. There's a couple things to keep in mind about why Elrond didn't just push him in. Number one, don't take the quote-unquote humanity aspect out of it. This was the king of men, Right? This wasn't just someone, this was the king of men, and if you're Elrond, your friend and ally. Number two, as far as we know, up until this point in the story of Middle-earth, the ring had never been in the possession of anybody else, right? So they didn't know that the ring of power, if in the possession of some individual, it will eventually just corrupt you, right? Right? So I'm guessing if Isildur knew or if Elrond knew exactly what the ring was going to do to Isildur, maybe he would have taken more drastic measures. But again, it is the king of men. So if you do that, you're going to have then all-out war between men and elves. He is your friend. And you didn't really know what it was going to do. So all that together mean, meant committing murder probably wasn't something. Now, us in hindsight, we know what he should have done is just pushed him into the volcano then. But at the time, that probably wasn't on his mind. All right. Thanks for writing that in, Jerome. Next up, Jerome also writes, a guy at work who hated Peacemaker challenged me and said, give me one good reason uh, you like that show. I played, do you want to taste it? And I walked out of the building because I was, I was, because it was time for me to go to my next job and he wouldn't agree that's that it's all subjective. Yeah, I mean, whenever somebody says, give me one good reason, that just basically means tell me something that I actually already like about it. Like, you don't need to give a reason why you like something. Just like you don't need to give a reason you don't like something. If you don't like something, you don't like so You don't have to justify that. You just say it didn't work for me. You know, somebody says to me, well, what was bad about it? Like, if I talk about a movie I don't like, they go, well, what was bad about it? It didn't have anything good. I mean, you know, but you shouldn't have to give reasons for anything. Right right there, the person, like anybody who says to you, give me one good reason why this was good, you know there's no point in having a conversation with them. Now, it's different if they say, I'm really curious to know, what, what was it about this film that you found interesting? Like that, then you can tell this person's coming at it with a different mindset. But yeah, Jerome, I wouldn't just pay any, there's no point in having a discussion with somebody like that because that's a discussion that can't actually go anywhere. All right, and it seems like you recognize that. All right, next up. Uh, out of time, Tune Bard, or Out of Tune Bard writes, Hey, John, saw the jacked photos of Natalie Portman. I wasn't surprised. She put in a lot of prep for the Black for Black Swan. Uh, it's one of my favorite movies of all time. If it was a more popular movie, I would have suggested it for your movie club. It's so good. Yeah, she was in really good shape for Black Swan. I mean, not Mighty Thor kind of shape, but she was in really, really good shape. I like Black Swan. I think it's a really, really good movie. Um, I wouldn't, you know, put it in my top 20, 30, 40 best movies of all time list or anything like that, but it was really quite good. And I believe it won Natalie Portman an Academy Award as well. It's, it's a really sharp film. If you guys want to see something a little more, um, psychological thriller kind of idea, 
check it out. It's uh, it's actually quite a good film if you haven't uh, seen it yet. Ch take out of tune Bard's uh, suggestion there and go check it out. All right, Great Grabthar's Hammer writes. Are you, or Anne and Ray, familiar with the fabulous Filipino Brothers, directed by Dante Bosco, which also stars him alongside his real-life brothers? Its insight of Filipino culture in America within a drama-comedy context looks interesting. I'll be honest with you, I don't know anything about it. I've never even heard of it. Um, maybe Anne or Ray have, but I'm going to kind of doubt it at that. I mean, my big you know, doorway into Filipino entertainment is Joe Coy. I mean, he's my favorite comedian in the world. But no, I have never heard about this, but I will keep that on my radar, Grab Thar's Hammer, and I'll, I'll run it by Ray, see if he has heard anything about this at some point. Thanks for writing that in, man, and for putting that on my radar. All right, next up. Uh, Mr. Tidy Whitey writes, in Moon Knight, eagle-eyed viewers can see QR codes. Yeah, Chris talks a lot about this on the show. Can see QR codes in the environments of the show. These codes will lead you to Moon Knight comics that, that cover the scene that is about to or is currently happening. Do you think this is a cool idea and will it return? Well, I think it's a really great idea. Like, as long as it doesn't affect your storytelling, which obviously this didn't. And it had nothing to do with it. It's just that they're telling the story and, oh, hey, harmlessly to the story. In the background, we can put this, right? Anything you can do about that that doesn't affect the story or the storyteller and can just kind of be there, that creates an interactive element for the audience. I think it's a very cool thing to do if you do it. So, yeah, I, I love that they did that, Mr. Tidu. And again, and Chris, again, Chris Carr talks about this quite a bit. She really enjoyed that part of it as well. Thanks for pointing that out. All right, next up. War Doctor writes, Hey, John and crew, with the Maple Leaves <laughs> and my team, the Kings, being knocked out, who do you have winning the Stanley Cup? My picks are either Calgary or Panthers. Thanks and bring on the filthy. I honestly, listen, I, I don't care. I don't care anymore. I mean, I, I was, I, I am a long-suffering Maple Leafs fan. They've never been to the Stanley Cup finals in my lifetime. And I really thought this was the year that they could not necessarily win the Stanley Cup. I really thought this was the year they could go to the Cup. I really did. And then, once again, getting booted right out of the first round. It's been like, I don't know, getting close on two decades since they've won a playoff round. It's just, uh, I, I just, I, my heart's so broken, War Doctor, I don't even care anymore. <laughs> anyway, I hope your team, whoever's left outside of the Kings, goes on to win it. All right. Bad American Man writes, at the AMC 20 Theater next to AMC headquarters here in Kansas City, I've been to that AMC. That's a really nice one. Most of the concessions are all pre-made. All you have to do is grab your own food and go to the cashier. The lines go a lot quicker from what I've seen. Yeah, they do that as well at the AMC City Walk at Universal City. And it's an interesting way to do it. It also depends a lot more on an honor system because... To me, it seems like you could easily shoplift if you wanted to. I don't know. Maybe they have safeguards for that. But yeah, I like that a lot because half of the time waiting in line is the kid doing the best they can, the kid taking the order and then saying, okay, and then walking away from the register, going around, get the popcorn, grab the drink, blah, blah. Meanwhile, everybody's just still standing in line. Nobody's moving. A system where everybody could grab their own stuff so that when you get in line, the only thing you do is, here's my stuff, pay, leave, next person up, pay, leave, next person up, right? I think it probably would help if they found a secure way to do it. And I think that's probably the, the tough part about it. But anyway, great for bringing that up, Bad American. All right, next up, uh, Theater Pup writes, hi, John. Have you seen the Essex Serpent on Apple TV Plus yet? Never even heard of it. Claire Danes. Oh, no, no. Claire Danes and Tom Hiddleston. Yes, I have heard of it. I take that back. Claire Danes and Tom Hiddleston have great chemistry, and it's a fascinating debate on faith versus science. Uh, no, but that sounds... I Obviously, I really love Tom Hiddleston. Um, what's the... Stardust is the movie that made me fall in love with Claire Danes. And that sounds awesome to me. Uh, I'm one of these guys that I don't I don't believe and you have to make a distinction or pick a side between faith and science. I personally believe faith and science go hand in hand. But hey, that, you know, that's just me. But that I love stuff like that. So I will be interested in checking that out at some point. Thanks, Theater Pup. All right, next up. Uh, Wesley Cunningham writes, Crying kids are my biggest pet peeve in a theater. Recently, worst... Recently, worst in no way home for me. Uh, me and my dad, a uh, baby crying all... All the the, let me try this again. 
Crying kids are my biggest pet peeve in a theater. Recently worst in no way home for me and my dad. Baby crying all the quiet talking all did you meant all through all through the quiet talking scenes and the parent refused to take them out didn't ruin the movie but just inconsiderate damn yeah look i'm i hear people like aaron cummings take extreme positions of you shouldn't bring your babies to a movie theater at all i don't believe in that if you're a parent it's tough to get a babysitter like on top of everything else. And listen, if you're a parent and you can bring your baby to a movie, I, I'm perfectly all for that. I had no problem with that. As long as the parent bringing the baby understands that, hey, if your baby starts to cry, take a second or two to see if you can get them to settle down. And if they can't, because they're babies, babies will cry. If you can't, then you have to be considerate and walk out of the theater until your baby settles down. It, it, I, I have, again, I don't get mad that people bring their babies. That's fine. I get mad when they're inconsiderate and it's fine that you had to go through a lot to get there to be with your baby. But guess what? Everybody in that theater paid money to be there to watch a movie and you are taking away from their experience. So yeah, you just got to be considerate and yeah, that sucks. That means you're going to miss a little bit of the movie, but you know, that's your responsibility since you're the one who brought the baby. Anyway, that's just kind of my take on it. Thanks for sharing Wesley. Hey guys, we want to take a second to thank the sponsor of this video, Athletic Greens. Now, when you get really busy, and you guys know that Ann and I are really busy, one of the first things that you sacrifice is eating healthy. And you know, I simply have never eaten enough vegetables in my diet, I admit it. So for a long time, I've been looking for a really good all-in-one supplement that helps me get those nutrients and vitamins that my body needs. And thank goodness, I found Athletic Greens AG1. So what is Athletic Greens AG1? Well, with one delicious scoop of AG1, you're absorbing 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source superfoods, and probiotics to help you start your day right. And for me and Ann, it's easy. We get up in the morning, we pour a big glass of water and add one scoop of AG1. So many people today are taking some kind of multivitamin and it's important to choose one with high quality ingredients that your body will actually absorb. And it's cheaper than getting all those different supplements yourself. And on top of giving you all those vitamins and nutrients, it also supports better sleep and quality of recovery and supports mental clarity and alertness. Right now, it's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. It's just one scoop and a cup of water every day. That's it. No need for a million different pills and supplements to look out for your health. And to make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash mailbag. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash mailbag to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. Uh, next up, we've got uh, H Squared writes, My theory for Secret Invasion is that it will be about the Skrulls being utilized to replace world leaders that were blipped. I'm not sure how they will utilize this, but that seems like the way to go. I mean, yeah, there's this Secret Wars or Secret Invasion is going to be completely different from the comic story. I mean, obviously, number one, we found out at least a part of this movie is taking place during the blip. In the comic book version of it, there is no blip. So there's that's already one big difference. Um, the Skrulls are good guys in the movie universe, so that's another big difference. I mean, so I don't know what they're going to do. But again, as good guys and as allies of humanity, what would be the motivation of the Skrulls to take the place of world leaders? Unless it's under Nick Fury... But Nick Fury isn't there during the blip. So, I mean, I don't know. I, I have no idea how they're going to do it. I'm sure, again, I'm sure Kevin Feige has a great idea. I'm just not sure how they're going to go about doing it. All right. Next up, uh, Julius Goodwin writes, uh, Good afternoon. First, let me express my best wishes for your mom. Thank you so much. I do appreciate that. And hope things are well, Mr. Campia. While I have a chance, I just wanted to ask uh, Miss Carr and Miss Cummings. Okay. Um, okay, uh, what do they consider their breakout roles in their careers? Okay, just to be clear, Julius, this is not where you send in a question to be read on the John Campia show, right? It's specifically in that paragraph there. This is for mailbag. So these questions come to mailbag. If you want a question answered on the John Campia show, you have to be watching live and send it in during live, during the show, in the super chat section of the YouTube chat, not to this link here. Um, 
with with Miss Carr, I don't know what Chris's um, breakout role is. I don't know if Chris would consider that she's had her true breakout role yet. I think with Aaron, she considers her spot. She did a, a big guest spot on uh, what's the name of that damn one with the three witches. Uh, what's the name of it again? Charmed. I had to take a second and look it up. Charmed. I think Aaron considers hers charmed. Another one was when she had a small spot on uh, Star Trek Enterprise. But I think she points to Charmed as being the first uh, legit television gig she booked once she came to L.A. So I think that's the one for her. All right. Thanks. Oh, by the way, I just noticed that. Uh, Julie sent in like a $50 tip. Thank you so much for that, man. And, and I feel bad that, yeah, again, you wrote this into mailbag when Chris and Aaron aren't here, but that is the best that I've got. Again, I, I don't think Chris would consider that she's had her big breakout role yet. And I think Aaron would consider Charmed to, to be that. At least I hope that's what it is. Anyway, Julius, thank you so much for supporting our channel on that level regardless. And I, I'm sorry that Chris and Aaron aren't here for that, but I think I did pretty good giving the right answers for that. I think I did. Anyway, thank you again, Julius. All right, next up, Sam Fisher writes, uh, I know you're tired of show name ideas. Yes, I am. Uh, me too, but I had an idea. You've always said you wanted this show to be the movie equivalent of Sports Center. Why not name it something like Movie Center? Or you can swipe a sports term, call it Armchair Directing. Well, the, here's the thing, though, Sam. I have also specifically pointed out that I will not put the name Movie in the title. Movie, cinema, screen, none of that. I don't want that any of that in the title. So no, I probably won't be going with Movie Center. All right. Thank you for the idea. For thank you for the suggestion though, Sam. I appreciate that. All right. Capri Grant writes, the multiverse in the MCU is based on the quantum mechanic theory of many worlds interpretation. It's slightly altered in the MCU, but it basically says every action leads to a separate timeline, which then doubles as its own separate universe. Right. But that's not how it's defined in the MCU, like at all. Like if you go back to Loki and you look at the sake of timeline, there's a million decisions being made every second, right? But not every decision leads to a different timeline. It's when a decision breaks from what time is supposed to be that that causes, you know, what they call uh, a, a, a variant or something along those lines. I can't remember exactly how they did it, but it kind of breaks with that theory quite a bit. So they can say it's based on the idea, but if it's based on that, that's a very, very loose application of the word based. You know what I mean? All right. Thanks for writing that in Capri. Next, we've got YouTube Hall of Fame who writes. Hey, John and or Rob, just me today. I just want to say you've made the Hall of Fame of YouTube for putting together the best damn movie talk show on the planet. Well, thank you for that. John, you've made the best team and I enjoy your show every day. Thanks for it. Bring on the filthy. Well, thank you so much for that YouTube Hall of Fame. Um, look, there are things I'm good at. There are things I am bad at. But the one thing that I, I really do consider myself very, very good at and that I've been able to, to apply for many years is my ability to recognize what will make a good team. And it's not always the absolute best people, but sometimes I get lucky and I do get to work with the absolute best people, but it's just like which people will fit into the vision that I have for the channel, which person brings certain skills and how will those skills and characteristics match with the other people I want to bring on the team. And yeah, like right now between me, uh, producer Jonathan, Ray, Rob, uh, Chris Carr, Aaron Cummings. I mean, I think we've got a really good dynamic and I'm, I'm really happy with where things are right now. Thank you for saying so, man. I appreciate that. All right, next up. Orange Hand writes, Loki, I've met my variants from the multiverse. Spider-Man, I too met my variants from the multiverse. Strange, I've also met my variants from the multiverse. Moon Knight, you know, I'm something of a multiverse myself. I'm... I don't get the joke. I mean, I know that's something that Goblin says, Norman says in Spider-Man. I I don't know the application of that to Moon Knight, but okay, Orange Hand, thanks for writing in anyway. All right, next up, Justin Jorgensen writes, Hey, can't be a crew. I wanted to say that when I worked at AMC, the higher-ups actually started using the term the Jumanji effect. At our theater, both Jumanji movies were in theaters longer than Endgame was, which is crazy. Love the Jumanji movies. Yeah, the Jumanji movies had really long legs. Like, they they prefer, performed very, very well. Like, they, they never had a crazy, mind-blowing weekend. It's just that it very just had a good, steady run, a very, like, good weekend's. But it just maintained that for a long time. I think his word of mouth got out, especially that first one. I'm not a I'm not a 
huge fan of the second Dwayne Johnson Jumanji movie. Um, I like it though. Don't get me wrong. I like it. I do. It, but that first one, that first one, you know, with Jack Black, Kev, uh, Kevin Hart, Dwayne Johnson. I mean, it just, it had such a charm and a humor about it. It was, it's just so infinitely entertaining. And I think it took a little while for word of that to, to really seep out that, ev that everybody was enjoying it. And then more and more people would come and keep coming and keep coming. Whereas like movies like Endgame, everybody's got to see it, but everybody goes sees it in the first two weeks, right? Because everybody already knew they were going to go see it. But yeah, that's a, that's a movie that really had a long legs. All right. Thanks for writing that in, Justin. All right. Next up, Anonymous writes. Can you give your updated impressions of the future of Beasts, uh, Beasts with the Dumbledore box office and press in it? Uh, I worked on the film and discovered your show when looking for first reactions. Thanks. I don't know that there's much to update. I mean, listen, the movie did uh, what it did. Let me look it up here. I mean, so the movie ended up making 380, close to $390 million, somewhere in that neighborhood, uh, which is nothing to sneeze at. That's not bad, but it is by far the lowest grossing of the, of the Potter films. I, I just don't know, which is a shame because I actually thought The Secrets of Dumbledore was quite good. Uh, I thought it was good. I, I had a good time with it. I went and watched it twice uh, and I enjoyed it quite a bit. And, you know, I, so I don't know what the future of it's going to be. I don't really have an updated impression of it. I still think exactly what I thought before. I thought this is a fun, enjoyable movie. I, I just thought it was really quite good. Not going to be in my top 10 of the year, but I, quite, quite, I thought it was quite solid. But with all the drama going on behind the scenes of that movie be between the Ezra Miller stuff, the uh, JK Rowling stuff, the um, I mean, everything else. And then the box office issues that it's having. I honestly don't know if there's going to be another fantastic beast movie right now. I'd say the odds are under 50%. And, and I hope I'm wrong because like I said, I enjoyed this movie. So I would like to see the next chapter, but if, if I had to bet $5, I'm, I'm going to guess it doesn't happen. I don't know that for sure. I haven't heard any insider information, but we'll see how that goes. All right. Thanks for writing in. Next up, Garden Variety Vagabond writes, one of two. Hey guys, I love the MCU, but find the current status of so many large storylines in a little, a little off-putting, for lack of a better term. The original buildup for the gang from start to end game had a certain linear aspect, even if a twisty one. Uh, two of two, but I feel it has gone from twisty to spiraling. There's just too much. So now comes secret invasion and I have zero interest. Yeah. Look, I mean, it's phase the first few phases of the MCU, there was an underlying ongoing story, but for the most part, they treated each movie as their own individual movies, right? Like guardians of the galaxy had aspects of the infinity saga in it, but for the most part, it was just a guardians of the galaxy movie. Iron Man, all three Iron Man movies had aspects that contributed to the overall infinity saga story, but really for the most part, each one of the Iron Man movies were their own individual films as was Ant-Man, as was Dr. Strange, as was, you know, whatever you name it. Now it feels like, and, and again, look, I mentioned these concerns a lot and at the risk of sounding like I'm negative on the MCU now, I am not. I'm still a big fan of the MCU. I am dying for Thor. Cannot wait to see Thor Love and Thunder, all that kind of stuff. But I'm also a uh, self-aware fan where I know there are certain things about the status of the MCU right now that I, I'm a little concerned about. One is I, I, I feel the overall quality of the MCU has dropped a little bit with them trying to do so much. Like they're pushing so much content out the door now that I feel the quality is suffering a little bit. Like still magnificent things like WandaVision, Shang-Chi, Spider-Man No Way Home. But I, we're getting more good stuff from them than I'm used to. Like I'm used to their stuff coming out and being amazing. But now we're just getting a lot of the stuff coming out is just good right? Which is fine for everybody else, but for Marvel, it's below the standard that they've set. Movies like um, Eternals, which I, I still think is quite good, actually. But anyway, Eternals, movie like Black Widow, which is fine, which is good. I like Black Widow, but it's not great. Um, things like Falcon and the Winter Soldier and Loki and Hawkeye, which I straight up didn't like. I mean, I'm a little bit concerned about that, but yeah, there seems to be this new emphasis on everything has to connect with everything. And 
I'm afraid that the magic sauce that made the MCU so popular, which was every single MCU movie, was a viable entry point for a new audience member who had never seen the MCU before. Like for the longest time, you could jump on board with the MCU at any point and you wouldn't be lost. You'd be right in it and you wouldn't be confused. Every movie was fine for that. It's not really, it doesn't feel like that anymore. Like Doctor Strange, the Multiverse of Madness, you had no idea what was going on with Wanda unless you had watched WandaVision and they'd never really done that before. And quite frankly, I find it a little bit concerning, but yeah, I am not terribly excited about Secret Invasion, to be honest with you right now. I can get excited about it. We'll see what happens. It's still a ways off. We'll see what happens as we get closer to it. But right now, Garden Variety, I am also not like jumping up and down with excitement for it. All right. Next up, Garden Variety Vagabond also writes in one of two. Team, I love the discussion on canceled versus ended. I have mentioned before that I track every TV show I've watched since 2007. So I identify each show as either canceled, limited series, or completed. To identify completed, I look for showrunner quotes that say it was on their terms. There are a few completed that kind of have an asterisk, such as Night Manager, Sherlock, and Mindhunter, that they ended but still have an invitation to return. Yeah, I mean, like Mindhunter... God, I still can't believe they didn't come back to that. That that really bothers me. Look, unless a show comes out where they say specifically well in advance, this show has a four season story. And then season two comes, season three comes, season four comes, they complete it and end. I would say, okay, that's a show that ended. That is No, I like the way you put it better. That is a show that completed. But then you get shows like a lot of people are trying to say Riverdale wasn't canceled. Riverdale was canceled because they totally would have done seasons eight, nine, and 10 if they would have been allowed to. So I, I consider that canceled. I consider most shows canceled, even my favorite ones. I mean, they're brought to an end because, yeah, they no longer draw the ratings. We've run out of creative directions they can go, all that kind of stuff. And they say, okay, time to end it. We're canceling it. Completed is when it was by design years in advance that we are doing this fixed amount of episodes, this fixed amount of seasons, and we're going to carry the story to that point. And right from the beginning, the plan was to end it there. I think, what was the damn name of that sci-fi show? Uh, now I can't remember. Babylon 5. I think Babylon 5 was like, I think Babylon 5 right from the beginning. I think the plan was, this is an X number of seasons long story arc right from the beginning. Those I say ended almost everything else I say was canceled. Unless it was a one season limited series, that's different too. All right. Thanks a lot for writing that in, man. All right. Next up, we've got Jessica Quintel, who writes part one of two. Hey, John and crew, love the show and watch every day. Thank you so much, Jessica. I appreciate that very much. I'm totally on board with not having expectations on casting movies and TV. That being said, I have a fun dream cast for the MCU Fantastic Four movie that I know won't happen. Okay. <clears throat> part two of two. George Clooney as Reed Richards, uh, Ariana DeBoyce as Sue Storm. She was, of course, just in West Side Story. Won an Academy Award for that, too. John Cho as Johnny Storm. I love John Cho. Uh, Gerard Butler as The Thing. And Daniel Craig as Victor Von Doom. What are your thoughts? And do you have any fun casting ideas for, M for MCU Fantastic Four? You know me. I don't care about casting. The only thing I care about is, is the person you're casting a talented performer? That's it. As long as you're casting somebody who is a talented performer, that's all I care about. Well, Judd, what about fit? Well, I don't know the script, so I don't know if someone's a good fit or not. Like, and if you say George Clooney's a great fit for Reed Richards, um, you don't know that because you're saying George Clooney is a great fit for the Reed Richards you've got in your head. But the Reed Richards you have in your head may be very, very different from the Reed Richards that's going to be in the screenplay. I always bring up the Joker as an example, right? We had four Jokers. Right. We've got uh, Jack's Joker. We've got Heath Ledger's Joker. We got Jared Leto's Joker. We got Joaquin Phoenix's Joker. They're all the Joker, but they're all completely different from each other. Right. And Heath Ledger was great as his Joker, but I don't know that he would have been a good fit for Joaquin Phoenix Joker. 
Joaquin Phoenix was a great Joker, but I don't know that Joaquin Phoenix would have been a good fit for Jack's Joker. You see what I'm saying? So that's why I always consider it pointless to do fan casting because you just don't know if the actor you're picking, the, the, the actor you're picking is a good fit in for the version of that character you have in your head. But you didn't read the script and now they're dead eyes now. The one problem I have with your fan casting here though, Jessica, because George Clooney, very good actor. Ariana Du Bois, Academy Award winning actor. John Cho, I love. Gerard Butler is the thing. That's a pretty cool one too. But here's my big problem. George Clooney is, I believe, 61 years old. And Ariana Du Bois, I believe, is 30. I don't know that I can see a Reed and Sue that are 31 years apart. 30, 31, 32 years apart in age. That's a little bit of a stretch for me. Other than that, all of them very good performers. I like that, but that would be the one technical problem I think I would have with the casting, Jessica. All right, thanks for writing that in. All right, next up. Viagra Falls writes, <laughs> a Niagara Falls, um, a variation on keep one, rent one, lose one. Binge every episode, uh, watch each episode weekly or never watch the following upcoming season of the umbrella Academy, the boys doom patrol pass. I just, I, I'm sorry. I'm just going to pass on that one. I, I love all three of those shows. They all have a real special place in my heart and I'm, I'm not going to create any false distinctions between them. I, it's just that that's just it. And boy, I loved the new trailer for uh, the umbrella Academy. Loved it, loved it, loved it. Cannot wait for the boys to return. Cannot wait for more Doom Patrol. I, I mean, and each one of these shows are so unique and different from the other. That's one of the cool things about them. And uh, I just love them all, Vi Viagra Falls. Just love them all. All right, next up. Remmer Bulldog writes, uh, Hey, John, uh, it still amazes me how people don't understand that Wanda is the villain of WandaVision. Agatha was the antagonist, but Wanda mind-controlled an entire town for weeks, even after Monica told her to release the Hex. I mean, no, that, that is a good thing to, to point out. Yes, Agatha was the antagonist of it. And 99% and of the time, the antagonist is the villain of the story. 99% of the time. But you're absolutely right. Part of the brilliance of WandaVision was Wanda both Wanda was both our hero and the villain. Agatha was the antagonist, but Wanda was the villain. She was also the hero, but the villain nonetheless. And it it is because they did it so brilliantly that when the final episode aired and I did my WandaVision after show, I said, "Guys, she is going to be the villain of Doctor Strange 2." The path has been made clear. It's obvious what is happening to her. It's obvious where she's at. And um, I, I just think that's great. But yes, you're absolutely right. Agatha was the antagonist, but Wanda was the villain. All right. Uh, Ghost of Rob's Hot Toy writes, not a movie question, sorry, but who do you want to win the Stanley Cup and or the NBA Finals this year? I have no, I have no dog in it anymore. I, I already said earlier, don't care. Now that the, like, the Leafs going out is normal, but this year really broke my heart. So I I don't care. I don't care anymore. <laughs> Not this year. I just don't care. And as far as the NBA, well, you know, my Raptors aren't there anymore. I would. I was cheering for Chris Paul to get a ring. I was cheering for Chris Paul and the Phoenix Suns. I really thought the Suns were going to do it this year. Really did. So with them being out, um, I don't have a lot of vested interest in this. I, I think who will win now is Golden State. I mean, they... They're firing on all cylinders right now. They look unstoppable. So uh, just kind of my take on it, uh, Ghost. All right. Just time for a couple more here, guys. Then I got to wrap it up. Uh, next one comes to us from Funny You Slapped writes, Hey, crew. My favorite movie last year was Nightmare Alley. Uh, but do you think the ending misrepresented the original ending idea? The original showed his wife. I think that was the Rooney Mara character. Uh, shows up and he's still redeemable. The remake didn't. Well, I mean, that's... Okay, so first of all, I, I didn't see the original Nightmare Alley, so I, I can't speak to that. But I will say is this, is that remakes do not need to represent the original. Remakes are and totally should be free to explore creatively and make different creative decisions if they want. They can become a straight up carbon copy remake and that still has value and that's fine. Nothing wrong with that, but they should all, they don't need to be that. They can take their own creative liberties and Guillermo del Toro, you know, he was always, he always said that this was meant to be bleak. This was meant to be bleak because what, uh, what is Bradley Cooper's, I think his character's name Stan. So 
with the whole ending with the with the betrayal and the plot twist with Lilith and all that kind of stuff, and then ultimately finding out that I mean the moral of the story is that Stan has been the geek all along. Which, if you've seen the movie, you'll know what I'm talking about, right? That was the whole thing. That was the that was the rosebud moment of Nightmare Alley, was that at the end, Stan realizing, is he hasn't just come full circle, but realizing that look what's happened from the beginning all the way through what happened with Lilith, and right up to that point, he realizes, when he says, "I was born for this," he realizes he's been the geek all along, and and that more bleak outlook sort of thing is the thing that Guillermo del Toro was going for, but uh, but yeah, that's just kind of my take on that. All right, thanks for that. It's funny you slapped. Next up, we got Mr. Anderson who writes, "Hello, John. I was wondering, uh, do you know how movie theaters actually receive movies from the studios? Is it some sort of proprietary formatted disc or something else? Also, I wonder what happened to it after the movie leaves the theaters. Thanks and bring on the filthy." Well. I have not worked for a movie theater chain in six or seven years now. I can't remember when I left AMC. But at the time, what would happen is these giant yellow cases would show up and you'd open them up and there'd be a hard drive in them. And on that hard drive was the movie. I think it was like a 500 gigabyte hard drive or something like that. And on that hard drive was the movie. And you take that, you just slide into the service of the theater and you could play that on whatever screen you had. Now, I believe I heard they now have a central server system where literally now the theaters can just download the movies from a secure centralized server that the distributors set up. And so instead of having to physically ship something, I think they can download it now. Again, I'm not sure. But again, when I was there, they were just shipping out these these secure cases with these hard drives inside that they take out and use. What they do today, not 100% sure, but that's my best take on it. All right. Last question we're going to take here today, guys. This is all the time I've got right now. Kyle Hicks writes, one of two. Hey, John and crew, just John today, uh, writing in again from Australia. I've taken advice from you about chasing your dreams and to do something either small or big every day to work towards it. That is my biggest life advice I give to anybody. I've been super hard at work for the past two years writing my new short film. I'm waiting to pursue my career in, uh, I'm wanting to pursue my film in my career in filmmaking, etc. I've also taken the kind words from Robert about starting small and build myself from there. I want to thank you and everyone else on the show as it's part of my daily schedule to tune in, bring on the filthy. Well, thank you so much for that, Kyle, and good on you for writing a short film. Like everybody talks, everybody talks. I want to do this. I want to do that. Very few people actually do. Like have the discipline to set out to do the things you need to do in order to do the things you want to do. That was another big piece of advice my dad always used to give. Do the things you need to do so you can do the things you want to do. Uh, but very few people do that. Everybody in this world wants everything handed to them. And the fact that you're taking those steps and doing that, I think that's awesome. Good on you. And I hope everything works out for you, dude. All right, guys, listen. There are still more questions to come from the likes of Geek Girl 1980, uh, Willow, Jerome, and others. Uh, do not worry. We will get around to those. I'll do another companion video this weekend. Keep a companion. I still call it companion video. It's no longer companion videos. It's mailbag. I will do another mailbag this weekend, and we will get caught up on the questions that have been sent in. So if you had sent in a question, haven't seen it yet, Hang tight. We'll probably get to it this weekend. All right, guys. Thank you so much for being here. And listen, this is the last video I'm doing for the week because today is Friday. Thanks so much for hanging out with us this week. It's been great. Um, I will bat be back again this weekend with another mailbag. Thank you guys for everything. Big thank you to all you guys who sent in these questions. Number one, because you gave us great fun things to talk about. But number two, you supported this channel as you did it. And all of us involved with the show and the channel. Thank you guys so much for your support. Okay, guys, that'll do it for me. Thanks a lot for being here. My name's John Campia, and until next time, my friends, bye-bye.